Welcome to the second day of our workshop on information theoretic models in psychology and neuroscience. A couple of uh, logistical remarks. Uh, each talk will be like uh, yesterday, about 20 to 25 minutes long. Uh, hopefully we'll have at least five minutes for questions. Please uh, ask a question using the functionality at the bottom or the chat room, but it's better if you use ask a, uh, ask a question box. And uh, it is a pleasure to welcome today as our first speaker, Professor Carl Friston from uh, UCL, who will talk about deep inference and information game. Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dimitri. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm going to hopefully just talk for about 20 minutes because the most interesting things usually uh, after this talk are the questions and answers. So I just want to tell a very simple story um, that is summarized in this slide that I'm going to repeat later in the presentation, that a good way to think about normative behavior and indeed good behavior is in terms of self-evidencing or trying to maximize the evidence for your models of the world. Um, and crucially, this notion of self-evidencing can be decomposed into two components, basically Bayes' optimal decisions of the sort you might find in utility theory or enforcement learning that is complemented by another imperative from uh, Bayesian theory, namely Bayesian optimal design. How do you design the best experiments to evince those data that will confirm or resolve uncertainty about your hypotheses um, con concerning the way that those data were generated. So formally, we're going to be talking about an evidence lower bound, also known as variation free energy, that is always less than the log evidence, the probability of some outcomes at some time under a model that I might entertain about how those data were generated. And I'm going to focus on various ways of decomposing um, this quantity here that is going to be the objective function for both perception and action. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to be talking about self-evidencing from the perspective of normative models of behavior, action and perception, how that unpacks in the context of artificial intelligence, and then uh, briefly rehearse a worked example uh, using numerical simulations to illustrate this mixture of epistemic and pragmatic imperatives and uh, how epistemic foraging emerges from this kind of self-evidencing. So taking a broad overview of normative approaches to the way we are and the way that we behave, I'm going to associate this log evidence or this evidence lower bound here with value in the sense that I'm always going to try and maximize the kinds of outcomes that I, me, would anticipate given the sort of thing that I am. Um, and this is consistent with reinforcement learning, optimal control theory, and so on. That's nice because the information theoretic appreciation of this quantity uh, is known as self-information or more simply just surprise, which means if I'm maximizing value, I'm minimizing surprise. And this is consistent with many information theoretic um, principles including the free energy principle. Um, in turn, the average of surprise is known as entropy. Uh, and so this normative perspective subsumes notions of self-organization and synergetics um, in terms of countering the second law and entropic dispersion. And it's also a simple statement of homeostasis. If you were a Bayesian statistician, you would regard this quantity um, as model evidence, namely the probability of outcomes under a given model, and that um, leads one to formulate good behavior in terms of the Bayesian brain, evidence accumulation, and predictive coding. So with that set up in mind, and considering that both action, our control, and our um, beliefs about the way in which these data are generated, can be optimized with respect to this free energy evidence bound. What does it look like mathematically? 
So what is its structure? Well, the reason it is called an evidence bound is that it comprises the log evidence or the expected log evidence and a bound that can never be less than zero. And this bound is the divergence or the difference between some beliefs about the states, the latent states, usually hidden states that are causing outcomes and the posterior distribution or density over those states given some observations or outcomes. So because this quantity can, be never, can never be less than zero, it means that the free energy, the evidence is a lower bound on the thing that we want to actually optimize. Um, I think that's a useful way of decomposing this evidence lower bound from the point of view of um, artificial general intelligence, for example, because you've got a model underneath the hood, because you have a, a generative model there about which you have a quantitative statement in terms of its evidence, we have um, for free an explainable for form of artificial intelligence. Um, we can also now apply basic Bayesian principles to that generative model and get into the game of optimal Bayesian design, abductive inference um, and self-teaching. Um, and what we're going to be focusing on in particular is this notion of optimal Bayesian design and how that at least in principle, gives you an entree into optimizing data foraging and epistemics. But there's another way of uh, carving up this uh, free energy bound here. I'll just toggle between the two. All I'm doing is shifting around these terms to rearrange it in terms of something that a statistician would be more comfortable with, namely an accuracy, accuracy term, the expected log probability of the data given the causes um, uh, or the states generating those data about which you have beliefs, minus the complexity where that scores the degree of belief updating on how far you have to mo move your posterior beliefs away from your prior beliefs in order to furnish an accurate account of the data at hand. And that perspective um, nicely licenses a focus on complexity, um, basically the quantity or the aspect of evidence maximization that precludes overfitting and enables generalization of your models often cast in terms of Occam's principle um, that can also be thought of in terms of complexity cost and via um, principles from physics such as the Jodinsky equality and Landauer's principle anything that um, self-evidences or evidences or optimizes this quantity under some given accuracy minimizes complexity and must therefore be the most thermodynamically efficient way of doing that kind of inference. So here's the return to the, the, other, the, the simple message that I wanted to try and convey today. We've been talking about treating data and optimizing beliefs about those data once we have secured those data. However, clearly to account for choice behavior, for action, for control. We have to think about the consequences of a move, a way of sampling data in terms of the evidence, namely self-evidence that I am going to go out there and make decisions and sample those data uh, in a way that maximizes the evidence for my models of the world. What does that mean in terms of accuracy and complexity? And it so happens that the expected accuracy following an active interrogation of all the data that you could go and sample um, corresponds to optimum Bayesian design in terms of maximizing information gain. M minimizing the expected complexity will actually correspond to making a Bayes optimal decision in relation to some prior outcomes um, about which you had some preferences or beliefs uh, and that minimizes your expected complexity or risk. So that's what I wanted to say. I'm just going to say the same thing in a couple of different ways now, uh, motivating why one might want to think about an expected evidence or an expected evidence lower bound or an expected free energy as the right sort of objective function to explain behavior. So imagine you're an owl and that you're hungry. What are you going to do? 
And when I normally ask this question of an audience, they come up with the natural response, well, you're going to look around, you're going to search, you're going to try and identify your prey and then predate once you've uh, resolved your uncertainty about the location um, of, your, um, of your food. Um, and that very simple example of foraging, I think has a lot to say about it. I'm gonna use a distinction between theories based upon or formulations of optimal behavior based upon value functions of the state of a world that ensues following a particular action and a functional of beliefs about states of the world consequent upon an action. Um, and I'm going to deliberately contrast the two and then what we'll do is repair that dialectic in a couple of slides. But at the moment, we could adopt um, a utilitarian approach here that you'll find in things like utility theory and reinforcement learning and assume the existence of a value function. And if we can find the right actions that maximize this value function of states, then we'd have the right policy, the right control um, th that enables us to maximize this value function. However, We've just said that the first thing we want to do is to resolve our uncertainty about where the prey is. And uncertainty is an attribute of a belief distribution, a Bayesian belief or probability distribution, posterior distribution. So that means that this kind of formulation can't do that because it's a function of states, not a functional G of the beliefs about the states. Furthermore, that little example about searching for the mouse in the field tells you something else. The order in which you prosecute your controls or your action matters. So you have to sort of consume and predate after you've done your searching. So that suggests a different kind of optimal policy, um, not a state action policy, but a policy that would be appropriate, for, say, for sequential policy optimization, where we're now take this goodness function that's going to be in fact the expected free energy of our beliefs and look at how it unfolds over time and the time integral of a um, an energy functional is known as an action in physics so we're talking here basically about choosing behaviors or policies sequences of moves that conform to Hamilton's principle of least action and it's listed a few examples of examples of these down here and i'm going to ask you to contrast that with the equivalent principle uh, that deals with the existence or assumes the existence of a value function of states namely the bellman optimality principle and that plays a central role in things like optimal control theory um basing decision theory and the like and it's really the distinction between bayesian decision theory and optimal bayesian design that i want to exploit in trying to put them back together again. So this is just a graphic summarizing um, how you put this evidence bound into action or how you would elaborate a, an active inference paradigm from a, a free energy principle. So the idea here is that you take the observable outcomes, you use them to belief update, to optimize your evidence lower bound, minimizing complexity, maximizing the accuracy, and then you take your beliefs about the states of the world generating your outcomes and use them to compute the expected free energy, namely, what would the states be like in the future if I did, if I pursued this policy as opposed to another policy? We score each policy in terms of the expected free energy um, that, as we'll see in a second, can be decomposed into risk and ambiguity in exactly the same way that a statistician would decompose evidence into complexity and accuracy. So let me just take you through that formally, uh, and I apologize for the equations, but I think they're useful just to look at the functional form and how you can get lots of really interesting special cases out of this uh, expected free energy. So here's the free energy again. We've already talked about it in terms of the, a mixture of accuracy and complexity that we can just swap around in terms and express it in terms of a bound on log evidence here. And here's the expected version, has exactly the same form. Um, but now in the future, given a policy, the complexity becomes risk and the inaccuracy 
becomes ambiguity. So what that kind of means is I'm going to make choices that minimize my risk in relation to my prior beliefs about the states I will occupy following a policy, whilst at the same time trying to minimize the ambiguity, the uncertainty about outcomes given I thought I knew uh, what those outcomes were. Um, an interesting um, homologue of these expectations emerges when you think about the expected evidence bound and evidence. What that looks like is an expected evidence is this basically an extrinsic value or expected utility um, in terms of the prior beliefs about the outcomes that you want to um, secure by your behavior um, whereas the expected bound um, becomes something very interesting it becomes um, a, like an information gain or an intrinsic value something that scores a change in beliefs due to observations that have not yet been solicited um, and this as we'll see in a second corresponds to um, Bayesian surprise or information gain so what I'm doing now is just uh, fulfill my promise that one can drill down on special cases of this um, generic goodness or expected free energy functional here and one important one is this notion of Bayesian surprise that you'll find in the visual search literature or mutual information uh, that you'll find in the ideas of um, people like Horace Barlow about maximum efficiency and uh, minimum redundancy. And all it's saying is that one imperative for good behavior is that the intrinsic value of behavior that minimizes uh, surprise or maximizes information gain. So let's just look at an, another part of this and let's just take a certain un uh, uncertainty off the table and let's assume that there's no uncertainty about the state of the world generating the outcomes. They're this, they are the same thing. If I can observe some outcome, I know exactly what caused it. And this is a, a, an assumption you'll see quite commonly in things like reinforcement learning um, and some forms of control theory. And if we do that, then we can ignore the ambiguity. So we're now in a purely risk sensitive context where ambiguity is off the table. And what we're left with is this risk term, the difference between my anticipated or predicted future and that which I prefer. Um, and this is known as KL or risk sensitive control in optimal control theory and economics respectively. And finally, the, the last move is I'm gonna take the relative uncertainty about the consequences of my actions on states of the world out of the equation, just leaving us with this term here which i repeat um, corresponds to expected value if we treat the probability prior probability of outcomes as the kinds of outcomes that i expect and prefer to encounter so this is just a heuristic graphic that expresses uh, what i've just um, unpacked uh, looking at the functional form of these equations um, Again, it's making the point that expected free energy um, is simply a mixture of expected value and the information gain. So you can look at this heuristically in terms of, well, let's think this is, these are my posterior predictive beliefs about some two dimensional outcome space. And I prefer to be over here. These are my prior beliefs. So there are a number of ways that I could bring these two things together. I could actually just move my beliefs, update my beliefs, or behave in a way that uh, uh, causes my beliefs to be changed, to put my posterior over the prior beliefs here to maximize the expected value. Or I could search around and shrink my uncertainty about the outcomes by disclosing information and understanding the nature of the world. Um, or I could do both, I could first search minimize or maximizing the information gain and then move to optimize my expected value so that's just a graphical um, cartoon of how these two components expected value and information gain conspire or comprise this expected free energy functional so um, i'm going to now rush through just a numerical example um, this is one which has been uh, in the literature for a long time now and, and presented many, many times. Uh, but I just want to present it one more time just to 
pick out um, the key um, ethological aspect um, of having both this optimal Bayesian design and optimal uh, Bayesian decision theoretic bits to good behavior. Um, I won't go through this. It's just a way of writing down a generative model, um, uh, a Markov decision uh, process that is partially observed, where states generate outcomes through a likelihood mapping. The outcome, the transitions between the states depend upon a policy. Um, and we have beliefs about the initial states and beliefs about the precision of uh, beliefs about that policy. And we can write down a simple generative model. We can then assume some approximate posterior. And having done that, we can then use off the shelf um, variational message passing to elaborate belief updating in terms of the unknowns, which are the hidden states, the policies, which would be known uh, or understood in terms of uh, planning as inference in the service of policy selection and the confidence or the precision of those policies. We can apply the same principles to various parameters of this model, the initial states, for example, uh, and then we just select our action from the uh, the policy, the sequence of actions that has the greatest expected free energy or expected evidence following the uh, the move. Um, here is a setup that we're, I'm going to use to demonstrate it. It's a little two-step task where um, a rat in a maze has got a choice. It can go, it has two moves available to it, and it can go and secure a reward in the left or the right arm, um, or it can go and forage epistemically for a cue whose color tells it whether the reward is on the left or the right, otherwise it could be 50-50. So from the point of view of expected utility or reinforcement learning, the expected outcome of the two moves is exactly the same. I can either go here and use waste one move epistemically um, and then with certainty go and secure my reward, or I can take a chance and go and sit up my reward twice or uh, two times, not at all. Um, but of course, our agent is going to be optimizing, um, it's going to be self-evidencing and is naturally going to go and display this kind of behavior at the beginning where it's going to do resolve its uncertainty, indulge behaviors that have this epistemic value, this information gain, this Bayesian design optimality that reduce uncertainty about the context and the hidden states in which the rat is operating. And then having done that, it is going to learn. In fact, it learns what we um, supplied to this environment that we always left the reward on this side. So after a while, that epistemic pressure for searching starts to wane. It exhausts the novelty of or the um, the uncertainty and information gain associated with this informational cue or this condition stimulus here so that this loses epistemic value and um, is uh, subverted by the ex the extrinsic value or the pragmatic value the um, the base optimal decision theoretic pressure to go straight for the preferred outcomes so eventually at some point after trial 20 here it starts to go straight to uh, the um, the reward. So all of this um, rebalancing of this uh, expected free energy rests upon a free energy minimizing learning of the parameters of the contingencies that underlie this world that it thought was volatile at the beginning, but in fact transpires to be much more predictable and exploitable. So that's it. That's the message. Simplicity plus accuracy is equal to evidence, evincing uh, Einstein's notion that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And with that, I will um, thank all the people whose ideas that I've been talking about and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl, for this fascinating talk, as always. Uh, and we can have a couple of questions. Uh, I see people have asked, so I'll invite. Uh, so the first question comes from Christopher. So Christopher, do you want to come on screen? Or I can read out your question, let's see. Maybe I cannot somehow. So I'll read out uh, Christopher's question. Uh, it, says, it says, do you have a view about how policy selection 
and the computation of expected free energy map onto action selection circuitry in the basal ganglia. <laughs> That's a that's a very biological and a very a very clever question. Um, yeah, I, I have I have a number of views. I think it's more a question of um, testing out various hypotheses given the message message passing scheme that you get from this formulation and seeing how comfortably it maps to known circuitry and known physiology and um, known functional anatomy of that system. So that you know the, the, the interesting views that that um, come out of this is the notion that the, the basal ganglia are uh, probably more preoccupied with uh, evaluating the precision or the confidence in the beliefs over policies um, in conjunction with uh, corticothalamic uh, basal ganglia loops, um, leading to a reinterpretation of things like dopamine where the reward prediction error becomes more nuanced and it's more not so much the reward that you're errorsome about it's really the um the you know the precision of your beliefs based upon effectively a softmax function of this expected evidence lower bound so there's a vast you know sort of number of questions that one you know that one one could uh, drill down on in terms of the overall architecture and the, the sort of um, Alexander and Lo DeLong like sort of um, sort of spiral architecture and how that relates to sort of hierarchical generative models that you would use to evaluate the uh, expected free energy right down to you know how you would understand things like dopamine um, within this anatomy. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, so I suppose so that answered my question actually, but really what I was wanting to get at was, um, is it the pragmatic component of the expected free energy or is it the epistemic component that would be um, computed by the basal ganglia? And it sounds like what you're saying is it's going to be kind of both because it's got to do with the precision, which is updated trial to trial. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. So, you know, I've, um, I told this story by carving up this single quantity into things that, you know, Bayesian design enthusiasts or Bayesian decision theoretic enthusiasts would recognize immediately. But of course, mathematically and in terms of the message passing and the you know, assumed neurobiology, it's just one quantity. It is a thing you aspire to. So you're absolutely right. You, you're, there will be no separate circuits for epistemic and pragmatic or intrinsic and extrinsic motivations or um, Bayes optimality versus design principles from the point of view of the brain, it would just be computing this one thing, which, you know, um, I'm not well versed in these arguments at the moment, but I imagine would have a lot to say about the uh, elusive role of dopamine, you know, is dopamine there to score uncertainty or uh, to, to score things beyond simply a reward prediction error my guess it is because it, it is it feel like it's it's taking a um, its updates are reflecting something which goes beyond the pragmatics and also um, implicitly absorbs the value of information and the information gain. Terrific. Thank Hello, you. Charlotte. Hello. You have a question, I understand. Um, yes, I do. Um, I'll just read it out if that's OK. Um, so I was wondering, uh, thank you, Carl, first of all. Um, I was wondering, would trial and error and action feedback always lead to normatively better? So in terms of um, compared with states of the world's um, expected values and beliefs, does your free energy principle allow for fluctuations? Say in development psychology, you have um, U-shaped development or performance. Um, thank you. I didn't know that. T tell me what you mean by the U-shaped performance then. So so um yeah so sometimes um say in language acquisition um children would first learn and then they the performance degrade at some point and then it comes back to normal so and i think just in general um when you're learning say a brand new when you're investigating a brand new scene you would have trial, trials and errors and your performance would fluctuate at least. And, right. Uh, 
so this is like so Piaget like sort of over generalization and then regeneralizing and yeah so yeah um that kind of phenomena would be fascinating to simulate and I can easily imagine that you would you would almost inevitably reproduce that kind of u-shaped behavior uh, just looking at the different imperatives for, for the learning so initially you're going to succumb to the novelty to the epistemic attractions of exploring the environment it wouldn't be by trial and error um, there's always the best uncertainty resolving move to do so this the notion of the Bayesian optimum design applies to exactly what you do when you design your experiment you design your experiments you make your moves you look over there you go and explore that corner simply because you know you're likely to get the best kind of data that's going to resolve your uncertainty about your null versus alternate hypothesis so if you put a little agent into a novel environment it will do that it will explore and it may well um, as you're intimating initially over generalize in the sense of trying to keep its complexity low and then having minimized the complexity it will then focus on the accuracy term again and you get these sort of nice um, depending upon the temporal scheduling these sort of nice yin yangs between the drive to get the right level of complexity I think there's some interesting work by Tally Tishby looking at deep learning um, where he sort of contrasts the um, reward maximizing versus information gain aspects of it showing this kind of progressive trajectory where um, there is a relative um, there's a differential in terms of the relative um, ability of the networks to minimize their complexity whilst also uh, fulfilling their, you know, in this instance, um, maximizing some sort of value function. But it'd be, be a great thing to simulate. You know, you know, if you have a hypothesis that that's the natural explanation for these U-shaped um, um, behaviors, then I can imagine you could use that little rat in a maze and make the maze a bit more interesting and then see how it learned its hierarchical model and show exactly that kind of behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, I think it's time to move on to the next talk. Thanks for the fascinating uh, presentation. Very good to see you. Bye-bye. So I'll invite now uh, Professor Bill Phillips from Sterling. Hello, Bill. How are you? Hi. Hi, Dimitri. Long time no see. That's right. Great. Yeah, thanks for, for doing this. And so it's my pleasure to, to have you here today. And the title of your talk is The Magic of Neocortex, Pyramidal Cells That Are Context Sensitive, Two-Point Processors Are Seen by Three-Way Mutual Information Decomposition. And you could try sharing your screen with us. I want to do it to have its full screen. Uh, yeah. Yeah, full screen. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Great. Okay. Is the sound okay? Can you all hear okay? Yep, it's perfect. And you can see? Yep. Okay. So the mutual information decomposition spectra that I'm going to show you are the work of Jim Kay. The dual patch clamp recordings from pyramidal cells to which the spectra are applied are the work of Ian Schultz and Matthew Larkham. Multi-site patch clamping shows that some layer 5b pyramidal cells have a functionally distinct integration zone near the top of their apical trunk up here. So an apical integration zone quite distinct from the somatic integration zone. I will show that input to the apical integration zone can amplify or attenuate transmission of information about the feed forward inputs to which the cell is selectively sensitive, while transmitting little or no unique information about itself. That makes it possible 
for the ever-changing context to guide processing and learning at the level of the individual cells without the context becoming muddled up with the feed-forward information. In neocortex, inputs to the apical integration zone come from a wide range of sources, including higher cortical regions, higher order thalamus, long range horizontal collaterals within and between regions and from the amygdala. These highly diverse and ever changing inputs do not corrupt the cell's selective sensitivity, however. Indeed, they may even make it more precise. Intuitively, it may seem to be impossible for an input to affect output without transmitting information about itself. But pre, pre, the, Recent developments in information theory, known as partial information decomposition, show how this is possible. Before showing you that, however, I will give you a brief glimpse of the kind of evidence from which the existence of an apical integration zone has been inferred. This experiment by Larkham uh, 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 and others reviewed in Trends in the Neurosciences 2013 involves injecting current and recording postsynaptic potentials at three well separated sites on the apical trunk of the pyramidal cell. And what they find by recording these so that the red here is the postsynaptic potential recorded here. This is a current injection to the apical zone. The black line here is the effect on the soma and the gray is the middle one. You can see that it has very, very little effect. Injection current here has a large effect on the postsynaptic site there, but very little effect on the soma. If we then inject a current into the soma here, a step current, you'll find, whoops, you find that um, there is a, an output spike. There is some back propagating activity going back up the apical trunk as shown here in black and red. The important outcome is that the exact same input to the apical integration zone that has no effect on postsynaptic potential or spiking transforms the output generated by the same somatic input from a single spike to three spikes at very short interspike intervals. And from that and a whole host of other experiments to which some references are given at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, they conclude that in most cortical regions, if not all, from perceptual regions, right the way up to prefrontal cortex, M many of the layer five and some at least of the layer two, three pyramidal cells have an apical integration zone. So what we're now going to do for a, a while first is to use three-way mutual information decomposition to try to get a handle on what the contributions of these two different inputs to output are and how we, they might be quantified and how that can be used to distinguish modulatory effects of the context from the effects of the input that specifies selective sensitivity about which the cell will transmit information. Bill, can I interrupt you for one second because we yeah. have a request from someone. There is a bar at the bottom of your screen which says yes. that Crowdcast is sharing. Yeah, you can press on hide over there. There is a hide next to the blue button. It says, yeah, can you do yeah. that? Maybe can. Yeah, I've done that. I don't know what. Yeah, I've done it. Yes. So can you see your, pre yes. Can you see your presentation now? Maybe you, you switch back to your presentation. Yeah, okay. Okay, so. Perfect. OK, so exactly how to define these different components of output in terms of the information transmitted about the two separate inputs, that's still being debated about exactly how to do it. The differences are relatively minor, however. Uh, so that the, 
components of output that we're going to be talking about is the information in the output about X1 only, information in the output about X2 only, two different kinds of shared information, one shared because in the source of the two information, the two inputs, there's correlated information. So any information we transmit about that would be about both. But there's also some information transmitted in the output that's about both, even if they're not correlated. And finally, there's information described as a component described as synergy, which is the transmission of information that is in neither input because it's concerned with the relationship between them and therefore needs them to be processed together. To make it easier to read the decomposition spectra that I'm going to be showing you, we have a consistent color scheme in which the unique informations are in blue and yellow with the putative receptive field somatic currents being in blue and the putative contextual field apical currents being in yellow. The two different kinds of shared being in different shades of green and the synergistic information being in orange. Now, there's a, a to some really, really good in, in introductions to mutual information decomposition. And indeed, uh, Joe Lizier, Michael Weaver, Al Viola Prizman, and others are running a workshop on exactly this simultaneously with ours. But you can all see it online. So I very much recommend that you go and watch, if you're interested in this mutual information decomposition approach, go and watch that if you're not there at, at it already. There's also open source software. You don't need to write, copy any of this down because all of this PowerPoint presentation is going to be available free online after the talk. So what we're now going to do is to use this decomposition to get a handle on differences in terms of the information processing capabilities of a local processor which we're going to first of all do in the abstract, but we'll then turn into pyramidal cells. And so what we've got here is four different kinds of hypothetical modulatory activation functions. We're going to compare them with the arithmetic activation functions with different strengths of input. But look first at these two panels on the left. They go from at the bottom from very weak input on the receptive field, very strong input on the receptive field, in the condition where there's little or no contextual or apical input. And what you can see is that making use of the interpretive scale on the left, unique X is the information in the receptive field information. The green is the information in the receptive field that it shares with the contextual field. And that as you increase the strength of the receptive field, then it, the, the cell or the pro local processor with a modulatory activation function transmits all of the information in the receptive field, including any shared. In this case, um, the uh, correlation between the X1 and X2 uh, inputs have been has been set at 0.78 so that the information they share is exactly 0.5. Now, by comparing uh, these functions with what you get with additive and subtractive functions, what you see is that the modulatory transfer functions perform exactly as though they were additive or subtractive under these conditions, providing that there's little or no contextual information. However, if you now look at the panel on the top right, you'll see that the modulatory functions now transmit no information. All the red is the residual information, which means output information in the output. Why? That's got nothing to do with any function of the inputs. Whereas, of course, the additive and subtraction are subtractive activation functions, as you'd expect, simply transmit all of the information in whatever is strong, including that, that it can um, that it shares with the, with the other. So when the receptive field information is near zero, there's no signal to modulate. 
So when there's no little or no signal to modulate, modulatory functions don't transmit any information. Where they do transmit information is shown on the lower right panel. You can compare that with the lower left panel where the receptor field inf inf input is the same in both cases. The RF is weak input. And on the bottom left, there is no context. And on the bottom right, there is medium or strong context. The results are much the same whether it's medium or strong context, as long as it is not itself very low, very, very low. Or doesn't. I'll show you later what happens whether it's strong or not. It doesn't matter. So the modulatory activation functions all differ a bit from each other, but they're all the same in that they transmit no information about the. Uh, X2, the secondary, and that they do transmit some information about the input. Indeed, you can see that as the red bars here are a lot lower than all here, it transmits a lot more information about the input. The modulatory function M1, which is that that was uh, designed by Jim Kay on the basis of NMDA receptors, uh, the property of NMDA receptors on pyramidal cell activity, and in order to make it a contextual modulator, that function, which is specified up here, that's the, the modulation function, it greatly increases the amount of information transmitted about the input, even though the receptive field input is weak, and it does it by increasing the information transmitted uniquely about the receptive field, even though it's the contextual field that's doing this. And it transmits all of the information that it shares with the contextual field and other sh the, the mechanistic shared and synergy as well. Now, with other parameters, other values, other conditions, synergy can increase here. And uh, Joe Lizier, Michael Webrow, and others who use of partial information decomposition emphasize the importance of synergistic information. It's therefore necessary for me to make it clear that for these modulatory activation functions, the transmission of synergy is only happening when their receptive field information is weak, so absent, weak, ambiguous. And that is shown here. S1 is the strength of the receptive field input. S2 is the strength of the contextual field input. You can see that when there is little or no uh, receptive field input, when it's very, very weak, then no synergy is transmitted. But as you increase the, the receptive field strength by increasing S1, then you, for this particular function, it rises steeply. But then as you increase the receptive field strength even more, synergy disappears for the simple reason that with a very strong receptive field input, all of the output is telling me about the receptive field input. There is room for synergy or anything else. So we're now in a position to apply these decomposition spectra to neurons. First, I'm going to apply it to the shy model, which is a multi-compartmental model of a layer five neocortical pyramidal cell. Uh, and these show decompositions from five different ways of defining the components of decomposition. Three of the uh, methods or ways of defining them come out with exactly the same uh, result, which is that they transmit no information about the context, but the large shared and synergy shows that the context is having a big effect on output, but it's doing it by adding synergy under these conditions and by uh, allowing unique information about the thing that it's modulating to get through. Th these two other cases do allow some unique shared from, from the point of view of perfect modulation, you're looking for an plenty of dark blue transmission of receptive field information and shared and synergy, but very little yellow. So there's being quite yellow saying that they're, a, they're not a great approximation to it if you use these definitions. But still it's the case that there's dominance of the blue, the, the transmission of the apical, of the receptive field information, the basal or somatic input, as well as synergy. Now, that model was a model of a pyramidal cell isolated from the complex micro, local microarch circuitry in which the pyramidal cell is embedded, as shown here by, the, by this diagram from Kubota et al., which is designed to demonstrate 
the zoo of inhibitory interneurons. Instead of trying to unravel that, we can look at a simplified but reasonably um, well agreed model of the differences between different classes of, uh, of inhibitory interneuron. And what, they, what this clearly shows is that there is distinct inhibitory regulation of somatic and apical integration zones. PV expressing interneurons inhibit the soma. Somatostatin expressing interneurons inhibit the apical trunk, as do neuroglyophilm cells. Uh, vasointestinal protein expressing cells inhibit the cells that inhibit the apical tuft, the, the apical integration zone, therefore these disinhibit the apical. And as they uh, disinhibit this cell as well, that they um, tend to increase the inhibition of the soma. So VIP cells switch the more of a balance towards the apical integration zone rather than the somatic. Although, of course, the somatic integration zone still controls action potential generation. VIP, simply in, VIP activity simply increases the contribution of the uh, apical integration zone. And again, we can show you this in this very recent experiment run by Jan Schultz and Larkin. This sh uh, slide shows the output of a pyramidal cell in layer 5b of rat somatosensory cortex with and without a GABA B agonist in layer two. So they pump, the, the orange is pumping the agonist into layer two, and these are the recording and uh, in, injecting uh, electrodes. So they inject current to both. The currents that they inject were the currents that were recorded at those sites in at that uh, the equivalent of those sites in rat somatosensory cortex in vivo so they recorded them and then played them back the apical uh, input is in green and the somatic input current is in purple these currents were varied in strength as shown by the gray scales on the right white means that the current was multiplied by zero so this was the, the, the first six rows here are all zero dendritic in, input. And then as you go down the rows of dots, which are the spikes, you're increasing the strength of the apical input. Going down the groups within here, you're going from zero to maximum for the somatic input, zero to max for the somatic. And if you have time, there's a lot of information to be gathered from looking just at the spikes and these controls and interpreting it with this. And basically what you, will, what you can see just by exploring the conditions under which you do and don't get spikes, that you rarely, and maybe here, if ever, get action potentials when there's apical input, but no somatic. But you get plenty of som uh, spikes when there's somatic input and no, dendri no dendritic input. So uh, you can see that re in increasing the inhibitory input to the apical tuft here reduces the extent to which increasing the um, strength of the, uh, the dendrite increases. It still, still does it. So that the, the baclofen, which is an, a, a GABA B agonist, uh, it, it increases, it's, it adds some inhibition, but it doesn't completely stop. Now, from the point of view of the information decomposition spectra that I was telling you about, the key data are up here. And as far as I know, this is the first time that uh, Partial information decomposition has been applied to pyramidal cells 
in microcircuit operation with physiologically plausible inputs or in fact i don't even know whether it's been done with any kinds of inputs and the results that you can see are exactly as you would expect if the apical integration zone was operating as a modulator as defined in those hypothetical activation functions that is it transmits lots of information uniquely about the somatic input little or no tiny amount of information uniquely about the apical input but the apical input has a huge effect through the shared and the synergistic components inhibiting the apical integration zone changes the balance and puts more of a balance down to the soma and reduces the contribution of the apical integration zone as we think this is so important data i'm now showing it to you in the stack spectral format as before and you can now clearly see how in normal operation without the gather the agonist being added and increasing any inhibitory input here what you have is unique information about the uh, receptive field information coming up through the soma via the basal and perisomatic dendrites a tiny amount of unique uh, contextual field information but huge effect for the contextual field via the shared mechanistic and the synergy and again cuffing reduces the contribution uh, the, the agonist reduces now that analysis didn't take account of whether the spikes were bursting in a burst format or not. It just counted the number of spikes within each of 100 millisecond intervals during the whole course of the one second, 1.2 seconds uh, presentation. We know from another cell and lots of other cells, uh, which you can find in this paper from Schultz and Larkham in BioArchive 2019. This is from that paper. And what they've done is it's the same paradigm, except now the uh, apical dendritic input is in green and the somatic input is in red, but they're the same patterns of input. And they've highlighted in red all spike combinations where the interspike interval is less than 15 milliseconds. So there's very short bursts. And what you can see by, if you have time, you can just look to see where all these columns of bursts are. It's where there's high somatic and dendritic information. And you can see again that when there is no dendritic somatic information all the way from here to here, there was no somatic, there's no somatic current, no somatic current at all being injected, and there's no spikes at all. So don't generate. Here, the somatic input is low, it's weak. And if you have strong apical depolarization, then it produces lots of spikes, including lots of bursts. Now, it's important to note that there are actually three uh, times on which apical current alone generates bursts of spikes that's here on trial 43 going down the column it's different trials with different values of these multiplicative strengths on these currents and trial 43 the somatic input is zero so there isn't any but it's maximum dendritic input and you can see there's a spike here there's a spike here a burst a burst of spikes here burst of spikes here the dendritic input when it makes any effect by itself rarely generates because the calcium spike going down the trunk has a, a width of we can't hear you i can't hear you at least can you hear okay, now something, yes something was going on with your mic okay i think it was my hand in the way oh okay thank you i think it was my hand in the way but it's great to know that when my hand's gone you can hear it is hard when you're present and you're not seeing anyone okay so other work done by a variety of other people show quite conclusively that if the apical current injection is strong enough, very strong, then it can pretty reliably generate bursts of output. So given this, we distinguish three modes of apical function. Amplification, drive, 
and isolation. Apical amplification is what happens when information from internal sources, which is the sources delivering in input to the apical integration zone, they come from internal sources or from external input via internal sources. And what, so this information, using internal information, information from internal sources is used to guide extraction of information from external sources. What I mean by guiding extraction of information from external sources, it's abstraction as well as e extraction. And it's, got, it's extracting the information from the external sources because it's transmitting information that's in the receptive field information, but not transmitting information that's uniquely concerned with the context. And, the example of apical amplification would be normal perception, where you use the input, where the input to the apical integration zone is used to disambiguate ambiguous uh, stimuli or to select that which is relevant to the current task. Apical drive is what happens when information from internal sources generates exonal spikes via the apical dendrite, just generates them himself. And the example of that that we're hypothesizing is thoughts and dreams. For example, apical isolation is the mode of, oper of apical function where no use is made of apical input for either amplification or drive. When the system is trying to be in slow wave sleep, it doesn't want to amplify relevant signals and it doesn't want to generate signals either that keep you awake. And as that would suggest to you, and there's lots of other evidence on this of considerable importance, the mode of apical function is strongly regulated by the cholinergic, adrenergic and other neuromodulatory systems. I note at the bottom right there that it does so via uh, the hyperpolarization activated current through HCN channels because relatively few neuroscientists and hardly any psychologists have ever heard of IH the current flow through HCN channels, and yet this plays a major role in determining the, the function of the interaction between the internal information coming to the apical integration zone and the ascending information coming in through the soma via the basal dendrite. It's a very major IH, a very, very major and understudied process. Now, uh, before uh, ending, uh, I need to make clear that in developing and testing these notions or exploring further apical function, we already have good evidence that not all pyramidal cells function as two-point processors. By two-point processors, I'm simply contrasting that with point processors. A point processor is one that adds all of its inputs up and then tends to sends a signal about that one single summed input. Because the role of the apical input can be different from the role of the somatic input, you have to treat those that um, operate in the way I've been showing you as two-point processors. But not all pyramidal cells are two-point processors. In the, the rat, in V1, even in the same region, pyramidal cells that have a short apical trunk, which happen to be those looking up, where, where, where avian flying predators or bigger predators are likely to come from, they function as point processors, hypothesized to me because that's a faster, pro, op, operating as a point processor is just faster. Whereas the, the, the more rostral part of V1, where the pyramidal cells are longer, operate as two point processors. And that the, the, the parameter that came out to matter was, if they're two point, they tend to be operating in two point function when length is greater than about a half a millimeter, as shown here. Two point, two point processing here, uh, point processor when it's shorter. But of course, from the point of view of interest in mammalian cognition and particularly human cognition, it's reassuring to, to note that the thickness of the neocortex and thus the length of the apical trunk of layer five cells leastways and, and for that matter of layer two, three cells is a lot more than half a millimeter. And indeed in humans, there's pretty good evidence that the apical trunk tends to be longer because of the thicker cortex. And furthermore, there's clear evidence that the apical integration zone in humans is far more isolated from the soma and therefore cannot can more closely approximate a distinct function than it is in rodents.
it's not known uh, last last I heard it wasn't yet known how close per, uh, non-human primates are to, to human the 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 the, the, the uh, the uniquely long apical trunk and the unique uh, isolation of the apical dendrites in humans was done with human tissue excised from uh, surgery. Okay, so this is near my last slide. I don't know how long I've got. Have I got any? We are about to wrap up. Okay, in that case, I will wrap up very quickly. So obviously, all of the cellular function that I've been talking about is only of relevance because of its effect on how this, the capabilities of the system as a whole. Capabilities that have been related to that function are listed here. And there's only time, therefore, for me to make two, two simple points. These two simple points are that coherent and relevant informax, which have been long-standing theories of the contextual guidance of learning and processing are very general theories, not nearly as wide ranging as free energy theory, but with some of the same spirit. Uh, and you mustn't be uh, misled by the term Infomax. The point of these theories is not at all to maximize information transmission. Indeed, the whole point of these theories is to minimize information transmission, i.e. down to that that is coherent and relevant. Uh, net hierarchical nets trained by deep learning don't minimize don't maximize transmission of information through their, their their hierarchical layers they minimize it down just to that which is needed to predict the supervisory signals the other the final thing that i want to point out is that the objective function from which the learning rules of coherent informax are deduced is mathematically equivalent to the algorithm invented long ago by Becker and Hinton for the unsupervised discovery of uh, stereo depth. They're now, Lily Crap, Hinton and others, are now using the two-point processes indicated by the physiology I've been telling you about to implement deep learning. But they're again doing it using context to guide learning only. And of course, we know in physiology that you practically always change learning because you change ongoing process. There are some uh, machine learning applications that are using two point processors with context sensitivity, as noted here, for speech enhancement and rapid sequence learning. But I'm sure there's a lot more uh, to go because biology is clearly telling us, or at least it's telling me, that the process, information processing capabilities of uh, context sensitive two point processes is rather great. And so I'm still hoping that machine learning people will discover that. And when they do, I expect that to have big implications for neuroscience and neuroscience for that. OK, so having made those predictions about fields of research that are very young, i.e the exploration of apical function and malfunction, because there's lots of known malfunctions of the apical dendrites, and the ex exploration of the use of context-sensitive two-point processes for machine learning. I expect those two fields to grow and to interact. So it's time for me to say, to be continued. Excellent. Yeah, looking forward to more updates. And I, yeah, it's very impressive that you come up with these predictions about you know, machine learning. So I have a question. I um, understand your model it focused mostly on deep pyramidal cells. Uh, maybe there are, of course, differences. Maybe they are, they are the targets of thalamic inputs, for example, which could act as uh, contextual, um, uh, contextual drives like the, or modulatory drives like the ones you described. What about uh, more superficial cells? So, for example, people talk, as you know, about gain modulation. Yeah. Uh, as a metaphor for attention, and Carl has uh, has pioneered this, for example, yeah. uh, targeting you know superficial uh, superficial pyramidal cells. So what? How okay. can this be extended? Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Dimitri. This is a very important question, and it's one much studied. And the answer to it is, in all probability, what the evidence suggests is that the apical integral the apical integration zone isn't just for layer five B cells. 
It does apply to layer two, three cells as well. However, the intracellular mechanisms by which it modulates response to the feed forward information is different and more dependent upon NMDA channels. Here you can see the little the, bl the blue here, are the NMDA channels in the basal and in the apical dendrites. And the layer two, three cells have a shorter apical trunk. And the evidence rather suggests from Lucy Palmer and others uh, that the NMDA spikes play a bigger role in enabling the apical integration zone to guide um, uh, axonal spiking. So the, yes, the answer is layer two, three, yes. Um, uh, there's not only this has been found in various different re in regions, including primary sensory cortices, second sensory cortices, and prefrontal cortex. No doubt there are variations on the theme of apical integration uh, function. Um, so we were just at the very, very early days. Study of apical function and malfunction is just beginning, really, even though the evidence for it was there 20 years ago, published 20 years ago, published to my knowledge, first published 1999, first published 21 years ago by, by, by Larkham, Zhu, and Sackman was one of the first papers, 1999. And there was a little rush of application of it to cognitive function, but then it tended to die away for some reason. I think because people um, became interested in other things, not because they found it didn't work. Uh, and also, of course, it's the case that um, doing these experiments where you uh, have multiple patch clamps at different parts of the same cell very far on this scale very distant but it's got to be within the same cell and that's all buried within an enormous tangle forest of tangle of clusters of all kinds of, of uh, dendrites and axons and other things to, doing these experiments is extremely difficult. And the reason that the point your own hypothesis has persevered so long is not only because you can do just a, a, in principle, you can do anything with um, a point neuron in principle, uh, but also because getting evidence for uh, communication between distantly related parts of the same pyramidal cell is enormously technically challenging. And it is not the case that the run of the mill lab can just go and do it. <laughs> this is the, the half a dozen labs in the world can do this. Uh, it may be growing. It's, yeah. it's very specialist data. Yep. Thank you so much, Bill. I think we're a bit behind schedule, so it's about time to uh, thank you again for the beautiful talk and move on to the next one. So uh, I'll uh, disengage you. Right, thank you. See you later, yeah. And try to invite uh, Peter on screen. Hello. Hi, Peter. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to have you here, Professor Balsam from Colombia. Uh, he will talk about information, anticipation, and dopamine. And I hope you know how to share your screen by now. Hi. So basically you you click on these buttons above your uh, your face. If you scroll them, yeah, I'm blocking. Great, thanks. Thanks for all of us. Sometimes we get used to to crowd dust. We good? I uh, I don't see anything on my screen. So you will need to click on this screen with an arrow inside button, second from the right next to the cogwheel. Have you found that? Yep, works. Okay. Okay, now we're going to move up to a behavioral level of analysis and talk about uh, what turns out to be a very uh, parsimonious explanation of anticipation uh, based on 
uh, information theory. And uh, it's a non, uh, it's not the normative view. So I thought it's important to give you a, the context in which we've, uh, we've developed it and uh, put the work in that context. So uh, my first point is that in psychology and neuroscience, uh, there's been the general assumption that anticipation depends on associative learning. And uh, that learning depends uh, on time only in the sense that temporal contiguity was thought to be important for it. So like in a standard Pavlovian conditioning procedure, you might have a conditioned stimulus that comes on for a while, and then it's followed by an unconditioned stimulus. And uh, the longer the duration of that conditioned stimulus, the longer the interval from the onset of the conditioned stimulus until the outcome, the lower the level of anticipation. And that's very dramatically shown in trace conditioning where the conditioned stimulus is terminated and then there's a gap from the offset of the conditioned stimulus until the outcome is presented. So um, here's an example. Uh, this was an experiment we did where there was a six second tone followed by a six second gap, followed by some food. And what we measured was the animal's anticipation of the food by how much it went over and checked the uh, place where the food was going to be presented. And what you can see is when the gap is six seconds long, there's a lot of checking. And when the gap is 18 seconds long, there's a lot less uh, checking. And this is traditionally interpreted as reflecting the strength of the association. Uh, but uh, we look at it in quite a different way. And uh, the reason that we do is that uh, if you consider that times are part of what lear what's learned, that interpretation falls apart. And also, uh, once you consider over what intervals an animal can actually learn to anticipate things, uh, it's not at all clear what contiguity means. So here's an example. This is the truth about trace conditioning. So when you present the cue, the in this case the tone, there's a lot of... Uh, of anticipation with a short gap and a less anticipation with a longer gap. But if you look at what the animal is actually doing throughout the conditioned stimulus, when it's the short gap, yeah, there's a lot of anticipation. But when the cue goes off, there's even more anticipation up to the time of reward. And in the case of the long gap, there's less anticipation during the cue, but there's more anticipation up to the time of reward. And the animals seem to have equally well learned about uh, these protocols, but the level of anticipation is what's different. And we have lots of examples that show that. Here's an example from an experiment by uh, Pizzo and Crystal in which a cue came on and then three and a half hour later, hours later, the animal could press a lever and have access to a meal. And what you see is that uh, about two hours into the meal, the animal starts uh, responding and it increases the likelihood of responding as the time elapses. And so uh, I don't think there's contiguity in the usual sense of the world, word here, but there certainly is learning about the temporal intervals. So what we think is that time determines the level of anticipation and they often determine the time also deter often determines the pattern of anticipation. In fact, we think learning to anticipate is learning the time. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples of where that's obviously the case. The first is eye blink conditioning. And here, uh, rabbits were conditioned with different uh, times from the onset of a conditioned stimulus until they received an aversive stimulus. And this is the uh, amplitude of the blinking response. And what you see is when the interval is 125 milliseconds, the peak of the amplitude is around 125. When it's 250, it moves out. When it's half a second, the peak amplitude is out at the appropriate time. And likewise, when it's one second. So eye blink conditioning shows uh, this. The, um, here's an example of aversive conditioning with goldfish. Uh, and in the goldfish, they got a cue that signaled that an annoying 
uh, shock was going to happen. Uh, either in one group of fish, it was five seconds after the onset of the queue, and another group was 15 seconds after the onset of the queue. And uh, what you can see is that both groups learn it. One group, uh, the peak of the activity in these fish goes up over a training, uh, uh, and it's at about five seconds. And here, the peak goes up over training. It's flatter. It's not quite as high as in the shorter case. But if you just fit the individual animals to, uh, to these curves and look at where the peak is, what you see is that basically from the very beginning, uh, the first time you can see a conditioned response, the animals are responding at the appropriate time. And the five second group down here and the 15 second group up here. So, uh, so these times are learned extremely quickly. And in fact, uh, we have examples of eye blink conditioning, aversive conditioning, repetitive conditioning, and they all provide uh, examples of where the time is learned uh, as the anticipatory response emerges. So uh, we actually think that even before the behavior shows this knowledge that the animals must be learning the time, and there's a really nice example from eye blink conditioning, as Davika pointed out yesterday, eyelid conditioning can be quite slow. And so you have the opportunity in that preparation to uh, teach the animal something that is not yet expressed in the behavior. And so here's a study uh, by Oyama and Mook, and the blue line represents the uh, presentation of the conditioned stimulus, uh, tone, tone comes on. And then when there's a shock at the end of the tone, the, uh, the rabbit makes an eyelid response, which is the excursion upward. When the animal learns to anticipate, then you'll see the upward trajectory in the blue, and it won't wait until the shock. Now, this is really slow. Here's day one, many trials. Uh, I'm going to skip a few days. Here's day uh, two, many trials. And then uh, what they did was, here's day three, still no condition response. Uh, this little excursion up here is just to show that the rabbit is still awake, I guess. And the, uh, okay, so then what they did in phase two was they conditioned the animal with a shorter inner stimulus interval. So it had previously been 750 milliseconds, and now they switch it to 250 milliseconds. And again, there's no response. And they do this for several days. But by day five of conditioning with the 200, uh, millis sorry, 200 millisecond in a stimulus interval. Uh, what you see is that the animal is anticipating and the blinks are beginning during the conditioned stimulus prior to the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus. So then what they cleverly did was they presented probe trials where they left on uh, the conditioned stimulus for 750 milliseconds to see if the animal had previously encoded that earlier 700 millisecond time. And what they found was indeed that on many trials, there were actually dual peaks, one at the 200 millisecond uh, that the animal had learned, but then also at around uh, 700 milliseconds uh, where the animal had not actually uh, previously expressed that learning. So the times can be encoded even before there's a conditioned response. Uh, so just to summarize, so far times determine the level of anticipation, they determine the pattern of anticipation, and they're encoded from the very start. And learning to anticipate is learning time. And uh, that actually, uh, the learning of the time can take place very quickly. There are a couple examples. Uh, in aversive conditioning where just in a single presentation of, uh, of an aversive stimulus during a cue, the animal uh, encodes the expected time of that, uh, of that outcome. So uh, to put this into a larger framework that we've been developing, so what is it that the animal learns when it learns to anticipate an outcome? It's confronted with the stimuli change and stuff happens. And so what we think is going on is that the animals form temporal maps. 
And like spatial maps, the properties of a temporal map are that it may be integrated over successive experiences, so long as there are com common elements, and that the information in a map is in the relative relationship between, uh, between the objects. Uh, so uh, if I show you a map of the world, it doesn't matter how big it is, the information about the position of uh, Berlin relative to New York is preserved across those transformations of scale. So how would that work in a temporal domain? Is that what determines the level of an anticipation? Is informa information the relative relationship that determines that level? So uh, in a typical experiment, when uh, you vary uh, the relationship between a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus, uh, what you might do is vary the duration of a cue. So in this particular experiment, there was a four second cue or an eight second cue or a 16 second cue. And, uh, and the time between trials on average was 48 seconds. And so what that varies is not just the absolute contiguity of the cue with the unconditioned stimulus, but it also varies the relative closeness of the cue. And so the, uh, and you can express that as the ratio of the time between rewards uh, relative to the, um, the delay signaled by the onset of the cue till the reward is presented. And so that's 13 times in this case and seven and four. So the relative proximity is decreasing in this case. And so what we'd expect is both from an absolute point of view and a relative point of view that the, um, uh, the speed with which the animal reaches say some criterion of steady state responding would be slower the less the relative proximity. And that's uh, exactly what we find in the actual data. This is an old set of data, uh, classic data, which is uh, replotted here, which is the median number of reinforcements until uh, these were actually uh, pigeons who were given a little light that signaled that food was coming and the light went on at different durations prior to the presentation of food. And this is how long it took them before they went over and consistently pecked at that, at that signal. And you can see it goes up with duration. Now suppose if it's relative proximity, all we do is we change everything by scale. And so our condition in which there's a four second queue and a 48 second inner trial interval, we change to have an eight second queue and uh, in a, a 96 second inner trial interval, and we just scale it up to 16 second Q and so on uh, by increasing all of the durations. And that's the way we keep the relative proximity constant. That ratio is 13 in this case. And what we get is that even though the absolute duration of these cues is changing, it's the uh, relative time that's regulating how uh, enthusiastic these birds are about that signal. So uh, we looked at it from an information uh, theory point of view, and, uh, and we're able to summarize a great deal of data by just thinking about the animals learning about the times to reward uh, and, and computing the average rate of reward in the presence of the cue and in the context. And so the... Uh, informativeness is the uh, information that's the difference between the uncertainty about the time to the next us in the context and the uncertainty about the time to the next us in the cs and that turned out to be an amazingly organ great organizing principle i think they're in this particular plot which existed for different reasons a long time ago uh, there were um, uh, i think maybe 12 different experiments or something from different labs. And when we plotted the level of anticipation as a function of the informativeness, they all just laid out beautifully. But, okay, so informativeness though, uh, also regulates the levels of anticipation and fear conditioning. 
And uh, to tell you about that particular experiment, I have to tell you about what's probably one of the most influential findings in the study of learning, uh, which is that the learning uh, doesn't depend on the temporal contiguity, it depends on contingency. And what people mean by that is that if you have a cue and uh, the probability of uh, an unconditioned stimulus in the presence of the cue is greater than the probability in its absence, then you get, it's a positive contingency and you'll get excitatory conditioning. Uh, if the probability of an outcome is the same in the presence and absence of a cue, even though there are pairings, then the, um, there's no excitatory conditioning. This is the uh, usually called the random control procedure where there's no systematic relationship between the cues and the outcomes. And then you have negative contingencies in which the probability of an event in the presence of the cue is less than the probability of the event in the absence. And this is thought to be the conditions that gave rise to inhibition. So uh, in a, these very influential experiments by Riscola, what he did was he presented uh, shocks in the presence of a conditioned stimulus uh, and also sometimes in some groups presented shocks in the absence of the condition stimulus. So in, the, in this case, uh, the probability of the unconditioned stimulus given a CS was 0.4 in this panel. There are four different groups. And uh, what was varied was the probability of the unconditioned stimulus in the absence of the Q. And that was uh, decreased uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.10. And then this is a test session and the lower the number, the more the fear. And so when there are no, uh, there's a perfect contingency and there are no shocks in the absence of the queue, there's a lot of fear. And when the two probabilities are equal, uh, there's very little fear. And uh, he did that in a wide range of conditions, varying the rate at which shocks were presented in the presence of the queue, and consequently varying the overall rate at which shocks are presented in the context. And uh, I replotted these data as a function of the informativeness of the cues. And what you see is that, in fact, the um, to an approximation, at least, uh, uh, there's a very strong relationship between the informativeness of the cue and the fear that's evoked by uh, the conditioned stimulus. So after... Uh, understanding this more recently, we turned our attention to try to understand negative contingencies. So those are contingencies in which the probability or the rate of which an event happens in the presence of a cue is less than what happens in its absence. And so to bring it into a temporal framework, what we did was uh, had a first hypothesis that the animal uh, forms an expectation of an average rate of reward in the absence of the cue we're going to call that the cycle time for the intertrial interval. And uh, then when a cue comes on, what it does is it delays the next reward. And the average rate signaled by the onset of the cue is the duration of the cue T plus the average delay in the intertrial interval. And so the expected delay goes from uh, the uh, cycle time in the intertrial interval. It increases by this amount t. And so what you can think of is that the factor by which the delay increases is just this ratio of the average delay signaled by the Q divided by the average delay in the intertrial interval, uh, called it relative remoteness. Uh, that's in contrast to what it existed as uh, the contingency theories and actually uh, also reinforcement learning models, which say that so long as there are no rewards in this, the duration of the queue doesn't matter. Maybe it might take longer or a shorter amount of time for this to reach a certain level of inhibition. But eventually, uh, regardless of the duration of the queue, uh, there'll be the same level of inhibition. This idea that it's the information about the relative delay in the time uh, predicts something quite different, that the longer the queue, uh, uh, greater the inhibition should be. So we studied it experimentally, and it's an experiment with rats. Uh, we have uh, rewards that are presented at a variable uh, 
time during the inner trial interval, usually averaging 20 seconds, sometimes 50 seconds. And then cues comes on, come on. And in these experiments, there's never any reward presented in the queue. Uh, so there's a perfect negative contingency. And uh, what we measure is during the inner trial interval, not counting when there's a reward, and during the queue, uh, was, does the animal go and check the area where the rewards are going to be delivered? And uh, we have in this particular experiment, different experimental groups with different durations of the uh, negative condition stimulus, the 10 second, 20 second, 40 and 80. And in this particular experiment, all of the cycle time, between the average cycle time between rewards in the inner trial interval is always 20 seconds. In the random group, they just get the same number of uh, rewards, but it's randomly distributed independent of whether or not there's a cue present, uh, or it's the uh, cues present during the in a trial interval in the other groups. And so uh, what we get is some very nice data. So this is a measure of the difference between uh, uh, poking into that uh, receptacle where the reward is going to be presented during the condition stimulus, uh, minus the poke rate during the inner trial interval. And what we see is that when it's a 10 second queue, uh, maybe a little bit negative, a little slower during the queue, and it's 20 seconds, even slower, when it's uh, 40 seconds, even slower, and when it's 80 seconds, uh, it goes down even faster and perhaps to a lower level. The random group where there's no uh, informativeness stays at about zero. Now, there, there are actually three things that for many years we've been wanting to know about this performance. Uh, one is, well, first, when let's say the animal starts inhibiting its behavior during the negative condition stimulus, when does that happen? Uh, and uh, when we detect it, we had in the past been uh, using fairly uh, a lot of different kinds of statistical tests. And so uh, we weren't getting perfect estimates of when the animal detects the difference because what we were doing is waiting for something to be significant. For something to be significant, it has to accumulate evidence. So uh, that was one problem that we needed to solve. Uh, and what you can see is subjects uh, change their behavior at different times as uh, the trials progress. And then we want to know what's the final level. And if we look at the slope of this cumulative difference score, that gives us a measure of the final level of inhibition that's controlled by a cue. And that can be steeper or less steep. Uh, so that would be the sustained size of the difference. So. Uh, but real data are noisy, and uh, we have looked at it in many, many different ways. And recently, Randy Gallistel had a, I think, a, a fabulous uh, insight into, into how to look at this. And so what we do is uh, we're dealing with a couple of problems. So one problem is that when you have exponential distributions of things, like in a trial intervals, sometimes they are very short and sometimes they're very long. And if it's very short and the animal happens to make a poke, you get an astronomical estimate of what the poke rate is. And uh, if it's longer, you get a lower estimate. Or, and so there's a lot of variability uh, from trial to trial in these estimates. And so what Randy did was he borrowed an assumption from uh, his rate estimation theory that uh, the what's going on is that there's an accumulation of the time that elapses uh, in the trial and accumulation of time in the session. There's an accumulation of the number of pokes that the animal makes in each of the conditions. And, uh, and that it's that accumulated uh, rate that's actually the rate that we could look at. And what you see is this uh, dashed line, which is the rate in the condition stimulus and uh, it gets higher and it bounces around a lot at first, but it stabilizes. And then right about here, it starts going negative. Right. And here's the rate in the uh, in a trial interval bouncing around and it gets similar. And what we'd like to know is when does the rate during the condition stimulus, the negative condition stimulus, when is that rate 
actually diverge from uh, from the rate uh, in the inner trial interval. And so uh, Randy used a statistic that's ba ba based on the kubler leibniz divergence, and uh, you'll uh, you'll actually uh, get to hear more about that in about 20 minutes. And what we could look at is the difference between poking in the uh, in, in the condition stimulus and poking during the uh, inner trial interval, and uh, see that as the rates begin to diverge, that begins to go negative. And so when we get a significant difference between the two rates somewhere, say out here, we can look backwards and ask what was the maximum of, uh, uh, of the rate difference before it started consistently going in a negative direction. And uh, this max can tell us uh, what's uh, where the animal first detected the nature of the contingency. So we do that, and here are the traditional ones we looked at. So when was it statistically significant? We find as the CS duration gets longer, there are fewer trials uh, uh, to acquisition to the statistical significance, that the slope, the final slope of those different scores is gets greater the longer the queue. And then really surprisingly, uh, completely blew me away was that when you go back and look where the max was, uh, when the animal first detects the nature of that contingency, well, first of all, there's no effect of the duration and it happens within a very, very few trials. And that's a point Randy's gonna re return to in a little while, but really extraordinary. They detect it extremely quickly. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that actually resolves a bit of conflict for us because we knew that the animals learn the times extremely rapidly. But when we were using statistical criterion to measure their performance, it wasn't so rapid. But when you go back and look at where that change first originated, uh, it really is fast. It's really within just a, a small number of experiences. So, so far varying the duration of the CS minus affects the strength of the inhibition through the contingencies that detected very rapidly, inhibition reached significant sooner the long of the CS developed at the same rate, and uh, uh, for fixed and variable, which I don't have time to show you, and the level of inhibition uh, was deeper. Uh, okay, so moving very quickly. Okay, uh, is it the absolute or the relative delay? So uh, is it the relative remoteness? So we just did the experiment where we kept the, uh, the relative ratio uh, constant, that is uh, 20 second cues and 40 second cues, and we either were uh, 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 delaying the cue by two, three, uh, by a factor of two or three, or 1.5, and what we found was indeed it was the relative uh, delay in the inhibition that produced the uh, degree of inhibition. So the relative remoteness seemed to be what was controlling the cues. And when we uh, look at the various things, again, we see that the initial detection is extremely rapid, but that when it reaches statistical significance is a function of that ratio and uh, as is the final slope. So, so far, so good, right? But increasing the CS minus duration also increases the cycle time. And so we turn the problem on its head. So inhibition is the cancellation of excitation. So the extent to which the inner trial interval becomes excitatory might be what's determining the inhibitory control that the CS minus must exert. And so, uh, I mean, you can see it pretty clearly in uh, in experiment one, where what uh, happens is when it's a 10 second cue, we delay each reward by uh, by 10 seconds, and so the average cycle time is 30 seconds, 40 seconds in the in the 20 second group, 60 in the 40, and so on. So the actual time between rewards in the whole session is changing uh, in the way we did that. So we want to control that 
and see whether or not it's the informativeness, that is the informativeness of the ITI relative to the overall context. And so in another experiment, we did that. We have uh, two groups with 30 second cues, two groups with 60 second cues. This group gets the usual number of trials uh, so, that they, so that every uh, reward is signaled. And so the, uh, uh, the delay is increased by the 30 seconds, 50 seconds. So it produces a 50 second cycle, an 80 second cycle. But here, we don't signal every reward. We present the rewards, but without signals. And in that way, we are uh, modulating the t average time between the reinforcers. Uh, and, uh, but we're still maintaining that when the queue comes on, there's still the, uh, the, the delay, 30 seconds plus the average of 20 seconds. So we got relative remoteness the same for the two 30 second queues and the two 60 second queues, but the informativeness of the ITI uh, relative to the context is changed in the different groups. And in fact, uh, what we see is that that indeed is what happened. So here are our standard groups without the inner trial interval reinforcers and they are quite different, but uh, when we add the inner trial interval of reinforcers, increasing the context rate of reinforcement, reducing the informativeness, we see a, an attenuation, and that's what we get. So in what it seems is, and there were lots of experiments uh, in this inhibitory group, I think there must be a, at least two dozen experimental groups, and it's the informativeness of the inner trial interval that regulates the degree of inhibition. So, uh, that's also the case in operant conditioning. You may have noticed by now it's just an operant discrimination experiment. If you have the animal earn the rewards in the inner trial interval by pressing a lever, and we do the exact same experiment with an operant experiment uh, to see if it's, again, the ratio of the, uh, the informativeness of the inner trial rewards uh, relative to the context that's regulating uh, the discrimination in this case, in the operant case, and we find that that's the case, that uh, the informativeness of the, even though it's an operant procedure, it's still the informativeness of the stimulus, which is regulating the degree to which that stimulus suppresses responding during the negative cue. And- uh, can, can, we, can we try to wrap up? I think we're approaching the end of the- we need okay, to, yeah. so here we are. Ready right, to finish. Okay, I'm just going to show you what happens uh, in the discrimination that. procedure when we measure dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, and what we find is that uh, at the uh, on here's the negative Q. At the onset of the negative Q, uh, uh, what we get is we get a decrease, a transient decrease in the dopamine signal and it returns to a low level. At the offset of the cue, when we go back to the inner trial interval, we get a transient increase and then a return to a higher level of dopamine. And so, uh, so here's the summary. Times are probably immediately encoded. The temporal regularities determine the level and pattern of anticipation. The degree, degree to which a cue is excited it depends on there being periods during which there are no outcomes or at least a lower rate. And so any time this excitatory learning or inhibitory learning, both contingencies are present. They are two sides of the same coin. And it's the reduction in the uncertainty about the time to the next unconditioned stimulus signal by the positive cue relative to the context that determines the degree to which both excitatory and inhibitory control will exist. And it seems like the informative cues regulate the level of dopamine in both the positive and negative stimuli, and that's reflected in the, uh, in the transitions in and out of the stimuli, as well as in the plateau levels in the cues. So thank you. And thanks to many, many people who helped with everything. Thank you, Peter, and uh, I, I terribly, I'm terribly sorry for uh, 
to bring it a bit to, to closure, it seems that we already uh, it is that we are already a bit behind schedule. But and I, in the interest of time, also would like to uh, continue with questions, and your uh, talk sparks those. So uh, I'll, again, I will not invite people on the screen because we're, a bit, we're running a bit late. So I'll read them loud. Uh, the first one goes as follows: When the duration between the queue and the food is longer, we saw some deep and uh, peaks. Uh, again, is is that where motivation plays a role? Can we quantify motivation as how many times there were deep and consecutive peaks? Uh, yeah, I think. I think it's what we mean by motivation. <laughs> so the energizing of behavior uh, as the time elapses uh, is what we infer is the motivational process. Uh, one of the reasons we did the dopamine study was to see whether or not as the behavior ramps up uh, in these cues, whether the dopamine ramps up. And on the, in the time scale that we're studying, we're studying 80 second cues. What we see is behavior ramp up over those time periods, but the dopamine signal does not, at least where we measured it, it doesn't, it's flat. The plateau is constant throughout. And, uh, and so uh, at least not the dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens that's uh, regulating the ante anticipatory activity. I see. Uh, thank you. Let's, uh, I'll read out that second one that you can see also in this box. Uh, if temporal information between A and B depends on relative times between A and B, then can this information be dependent or retroactively modulated depending on the value of B, say B is fear or, or reward? I'm sorry, it broke up a little. Could you say? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's also on the, in the box if you will click on ask a question. So I'll read it again. If temporal information between A and B depends on relative times between A and B, then can this information be dependent or retroactively modulated depending on the value of B? Say B could be fear or positive reward or reward. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah. it's about uh, uh, anidromic, how we call this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. no, no, I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> uh, right, so if you do something like satiation, <laughs> uh, the, uh, both the behavioral output and the dopamine signal is modulated by manipulations like that. Uh, so, the, so it's reflecting um, both the information that the cues are conveying as well as the animal state. That's entering in. Okay, thank you. So uh, thanks so much for uh, the very nice talk and we'll move on. We, we're already 10 minutes late. <laughs> so uh, I'll call uh, now Randy on stage and I think you did a great job setting up the field for him. So let's see. A virtual stage, I should say. Hope. He's around. So thanks so much, Spiral. I'm going to disengage you now. Randy should be with us in a minute. It says accepted and connected. There were some problems with his connection earlier. Now. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Yep. Hi, Randy. Fantastic. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, it worked. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, and my cursor shot. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Randy Gallistel from Rutgers, measuring acquisition with information theory. Looking forward to your talk, Randy. And thanks for everything you've done, of course, for this workshop. Well, well thank you, uh, Dimitri. It's, it's been a wonderful workshop. And uh, this was Dimitri's idea, and he did almost all the work. And uh, I've been learning an enormous amount. And I'm um, also, of course, uh, Please, uh, the opportunity to present uh, the work, uh, the, the follow on with the work uh, that uh, Peter Balsam has just described. Um, as Peter uh, said near the conclusion of his talk, uh, the problem has always been to try to estimate uh, when the uh, uh, animal has actually detected the contingency 
that we have programmed. And we do this by looking at the rate of responding during the uh, CS and during the inner trial interval. That's the traditional method. But as Peter pointed out, uh, traditionally one has done it trial by trial, and that generates extremely noisy estimates of the behavioral rates. And as Peter again pointed out, uh, we realized very recently that the way around this was to work with the cumulative durations of the time, not work trial by trial, but rather work with the cumulative CS time, the cumulative number of pokes that we had in, that the animal had made during that time. Similarly, the cumulative time during the inner trial intervals and the cumulative pokes made during that time. And one of the uh, advantages of this is that we're now using exactly the same statistical approach to assessing the animal's behavior as we use to assess the stimulus, so to speak. That is the informational input to the animal. Because one uh, uh, the major import of the talk that Peter just gave uh, is that in, in so-called associative learning, which in my view has nothing to do with the formation of associations, what is essential is the accumulation of information uh, about the contingencies in the brain of the uh, subject. And uh, those uh, contingencies, as Peter made clear, depend upon the relative rates of reinforcement in the context and in the inner trial interval. So we use the approach I'm now going to describe to assess both the uh, strength of the evidence that the animal has received from its experience and the strength of its behavioral response to that evidence. And the key to this is this uh, scheme that Peter, uh, well, let me back up momentarily. In estimating the poke rates, we put a Jeffries prior uh, on the uh, ex exponentially distributed uh, poke rates. And um, uh, so that just means that basically that we add uh, half, a, half a poke to the counts of the uh, pokes. And of course that gives us a gamma posterior distributions on the uh, poke rates and the uh, entropy of those distributions are the objective uncertainty about what the true values of those poke rates are. Now, of course, early on in training and in this plot, we are, look we are looking at uh, time in minutes that the since the beginning of training this is in the naive rat right so here we're 15 minutes into the first session and the rat has been making some pokes uh, in the inner trial interval this uh, the dash curve is the poking rate the estimate of the poking rate during the inner, uh, during the cs i'm sorry the dash curve is the poking rate during the cs and it's been making pokes during the inner trial interval and the solid red curve plotted, both of the red curves are plotted against the right axis. And the cumulative duration function that Peter referred to is simply the integral of the signed integral of the area between these two uh, functions, uh, poke rate estimate uh, function. So you see that we're estimating the rates moment by moment, uh, essentially. And when the CS rate is greater than the uh, intertrial interval rate of poking, then this, uh, the blue function here is the slope is upward. When they become equal, the slope is flat. And when the intertrial interval rate of poking becomes higher than the CS rate, because in this case, the CS rate went down, then the slope of the cumulative difference function becomes negative. And Using the cumulative uh, uh, coding cost approach that I'm about to explain, uh, this uh, negative uh, trend reaches a high level of significance here at uh, the point marked by the red vertical. And the black vertical marks the point at which this decline began, as Peter explained. Now, how do, what is this new statistic? It's uh, based on Shannon's coding theorem, which as many of you know, is that a maximally efficient code for a set of possibilities, in this case, a set of possible inter-reinforcement or inter-poke intervals, uh, 
is one in which the length of the code word for the ith possibility is proportional to the log of the reciprocal of the probability of that, that is the relative frequency. So the, in, in less technical language, the, uh, lo the less frequent, the lower the relative frequency of a given um, message that might need to be communicated, uh, the longer the code word for that message should be. And conversely, the uh, more frequently uh, a message is to be transmitted, uh, the uh, shorter the code word uh, for it should be, which is, of course, intuitively obvious. Uh, now, the Shannon, this theorem then establishes what I've started to call the Shannon code function, which is a function that maps the set of possibilities to the optimal lengths of the words for them. Now, in general, the code one is using uh, is not optimal. Uh, and the more the code function in actual use diverges from the Shannon optimal code function, the greater average coding cost, that is you're having to send more bits, you're wasting more electricity um, uh, if you're using an inefficient uh, code. Uh, because uh, the each time you send a message, uh, well, not each time, because it's an average. On average, you're, use, you're transmitting more bits than you need to uh, transmit. Now, one might wonder, why does this apply to memory? It's very, memory is not usually thought of as a communication channel, but that's a terrible mistake. That's the right way to think about memory. Memory is not associative. Memory is the communication channel by which the past uh, communicates with the future. So here, just to make the Shannon's idea as clear as uh, possible, uh, here we assume we, we're encoding with three-bit resolution, thus we have eight bins. Uh, eight bins. Um, the duration of uh, interpoke intervals or inter-reinforcement intervals uh, that are from an exponential distribution. And as you see, the high pride, uh, for some reason my cursor is stopped, uh, there it is. As you see, the uh, high probability uh, uh, intervals, which are of course the shortest ones, this being an exponential distribution, they get the shorter, shortest code words. And the length of these code words is roughly uh, proportional to the logarithm of the reciprocal of their relative frequency, that is the probability. Now, uh, those of you for whom Shannon's coding theorem is uh, vieux jeu uh, will also know about the kubach leibler divergent, uh, which is generally denoted by DKL uh, P and Q, where the P and Q refer to two different uh, distributions from which data is coming. Uh, and the kubach leibler divergence measures the average cost of using code words that, divide, that diverge. If Q is a Shannon optimal uh, uh, Sorry, this is what comes from using an unfamiliar uh, uh, Yes, if uh, Q is Shannon optimal, and P is not identical to Q, then uh, it's this measures how much uh, it's the average cost of coding data that are actually coming from the P distribution using a code that has been optimized for the Q distribution. And uh, if, ever, if the average cost is given by DKL, then of course the cumulative cost is simply the number of data uh, that uh, have to be transmitted or encoded in memory uh, times the DKL divergence. Now, the interesting thing about um, this statistic, which is the cumulative coding cost, the number of data times the uh, divergence, is that when uh, you actually are drawing from the distribution you think you are, that is when P is identical to Q, then uh, this statistic is distributed gamma 0.51. And since it has a known distribution, we can derive alpha levels or decision criteria uh, uh, that are increasingly conservative. So when 
if the cumulative coating cost is 1.4 nats, um, then uh, the odds are 10 to 1 that uh, P is not identical. The cost has risen to 3.8. The odds are 100 to 1 when the cost has risen to 5.4 nats. nats. The cost is the odds are a thousand to one against the uh, null hypothesis that P uh, is identical Q. Um, so now I remind you uh, of this function. Now you've seen it three times, so I think you, I hope you're really pretty clear about it. This this cumulative difference function. Where is my cursor? I can't see the cursor, but anyway, uh, here now are. Um, the, the function I showed you a moment ago was from actual data, but here are four more examples. Uh, uh, one from each of the groups in the first of the experiments on inhibition that uh, Peter presented. Uh, and again, the black curve is the cumulative difference function, which is plotted against the left axis. And the red curve is the cumulative cost function, which is plotted against the right axis. And the black vertical on each one of these plots measure, uh, indicates the maximum of the cumulative difference function. So in this rat, the maximum was at uh, after the very first uh, reinforcement. Uh, and the uh, red vertical uh, marks the point at which the downward trend in the cumulative difference function uh, becomes significant. And uh, you see that that happens when the cumulative cost uh, exceeds permanently exceeds 3.3 nats. That is the cumulative. What we're doing is, is if the poke rate in the uh, ITI is the same as the poke rate in the CS, then the cumulative cost shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, increase. And in fact, it doesn't in the random control group. In the random control group, this cumulative cost never. Uh, becomes uh, enduringly uh, significant. But in all of the animals that acquired a conditioned response, it does. And this line marks the point at which it does. And you can see here that, for among other things, the inner, you can see that there are pronounced differences in where the maximum occurs, pronounced differences in where it becomes significant, and pronounced differences in how many U.S.s must be experienced between the point at which the downward trend begins and the point at which it becomes significant. Now, remember, we use this exact same thing to look at the evidence for uh, that the animal is seeing. And uh, that evidence, as Peter explained, is the difference in, is the ratio of the rates uh, that the animal observes um, during the uh, inner trial intervals, that is after the offset of the conditioned stimulus, because this is an inhibitory experiment. Uh, uh, it's been that ratio to the ratio of the um, uh, time uh, uh, in the CS. And of course, as you make the CS long relative to the time in the ITI, that ratio gets bigger. It becomes more informative. And uh, one can measure how much more, what the information gain is uh, using uh, the procedure I've just described. Uh, I remind you that the cumulative cost is gamma distributed. And therefore we can take the log 10 of the p-value to get the weight of the evidence. And the reason for working with the weight of the evidence is that when it favors the null hypothesis, the log goes negative. And you see here that uh, this is the common log. So in the random group, they, they never saw uh, significant evidence that the reinforcement rates uh, differed. The, the evidence, the animals were getting was that the rates were the same, which was, of course, they were. But in all of the groups uh, in which the informativeness was being varied by varying the duration of the, C of the CS, uh, the evidence was accumulating uh, rapidly. Uh, and it was accumulating, of course, uh, uh, 
determined by how informative the uh, protocol is. So the least informative one was with the very the shortest, the 10 second uh, CS. And uh, damn it. And here's the same. So those were for individual subjects. And this is averaging uh, because, of course, these reinforcements were quasi, were stochastically presented. The evidence seen by different animals differed somewhat. Um, and so these are now the group averages in the four different groups in the first of the inhibitory experiments that Peter described. And the thing to notice here is that by the time you get to the fifth trial, uh, even in the least informed, which is this one, they already have significant evidence, odds of about 10 to 1, um, that, the, uh, that there is a difference in the reinforcement uh, rates. So now here are the cumulative distributions uh, from those uh, four groups of when the uh, uh, of the point in training, the trial in training, at which the animal began to exhibit conditioned uh, behavior. And you see that there are very big di individual differences uh, between the subjects. Uh, uh, you see that there's a slight effect uh, of the informative NASA when they begin, but that uh, regardless of group, approximately 50% of the subjects uh, have already noticed uh, and begin and begun to show in their behavior the difference in the reinforcement uh, rate um, uh, within the first five trials. Um, so we conclude, and this was really a revelation for Peter and me, that we've been grossly underestimating uh, how rapidly they acquire a conditioned response in the past. And that's because the initial conditioned response is very weak. And when you use noisy uh, methods of estimating the poke rates, uh, the response rates, which is what we and everyone else have been doing for decades, uh, you can't see that they're already responding very early in conditioning. So uh, that brings the uh, appetitive conditioning, at least uh, for rats in this situation, into line with the uh, uh, excitatory conditioning, which is uh, very it's always been puzzling why they seem to show different acquisition rates. Now, all of this is intended to show how powerful information theory is uh, in enabling us both to measure and understand uh, conditioned responding, associative learning. And it's also very powerful when applied to extinction. A, a, a so it's going back to the 1930s, going back almost 100 years, is the partial reinforcement extinction effect. In almost every associative theory ever suggested, non-reinforcement weakens associative strength and reinforcement strengthens it. If that's the case and you only reinforce, say, one in every 10 trials during training, then at the end of training, the associative strength should be very weak. And therefore, when you stop reinforcing altogether in extinction, you would expect rapid extinction. But in fact, you get the exact opposite. The uh, more sparsely you have reinforced uh, responses during training, the more responses it takes for, uh, the, uh, for them to meet a criterion of extinction. Uh, as shown in the graph on the right here, I, I'm not seeing my, uh, there we are. So here, the, the, this group uh, were only reinforced one in 10 trials on average, whereas this group was continuous reinforcement. And you see that that tenfold difference in partial reinforcement produced a um, tenfold difference in trials to extinction. So if you think about this from an information theoretic standpoint, and more particularly from the kubak leibler standpoint, you think, well, wait a second. when we begin extinction, the animal thinks it's drawing from one distribution, a Bernoulli distribution in this case, but in fact, it's now drawing from a different distribution. 
And so the kubak leibler divergence, this uh, formula here is for the Bernoulli case, um, tells us how rapidly uh, information is accumulating that the uh, contingency has changed. And if you plug in the values, the training values here to the kubak leibler divergence and do a little algebra, uh, you end up with uh, this. And <laughs> The solid line here is the uh, is the slope predicted by uh, by this algebraic result from the Kubak uh, Leibler thing. The and the only free parameter here is the intercept, the elevation of this uh, solid line, and that's a function of the criterion that the experimenters have applied. This is data from. Um, uh, experiment by Gibbon and, and collaborators uh, oh, 40 years ago. Um, so we get a parameter free quantitative explanation of the partial reinforcement uh, extinction effect just from applying the Kubak Leibler divergence. And that is fairly dramatic evidence of the uh, power of information theory in helping us to better understand what's going on in uh, so-called associative learning. That's it. Okay. Thanks so much, Randy. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get the point out of the way to see the screen. Okay. <laughs> I'm working on the PC and the I... Name, I uh, bottom which is on the right here. Not It's not a Mac. So <laughs> it's... Uh, so hang, on. Oh, wait, 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 hang on. Uh, hang on. I'm clicking on it. Adam, I need your... <laughs> How do I close this? Just a second. Yeah, I, I mean, if we don't need your... If we don't need your screen... <laughs> I can. Adam, I need your help on closing the PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I'm trying. Nothing you click on behaves quite the same on a PC as it does on a. How do I close that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you want to close it all together, or you just want to? Uh, yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. And you want to get back to? Yeah. Maybe I we can uh, close your. Uh... Yep. Uh, what happened now? I don't know where Randy went. Trying to invite him again to screen on screen. Are you hearing me? Hi again. Yeah, something happened. I don't know what. Uh, okay, I don't. I get it. This message comes up and says do you want to join again no yes. anyway here we are so I see here, yeah i haven't seen any uh, should i click uh, up and ask a question yeah i, I don't okay, see I don't no think questions any, are. <laughs> uh, simon <laughs> says uh you like the idea that the memories and information channel between the past and the future yeah i mean that yes. was uh, <laughs> uh yeah that was a good remark <laughs> I, I guess I'm have you, have you worked on my gravestone. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear. You. I, I'm going to have that message inscribed on my gravestone because I think it's the right way to think about memory. Forget about associations. Think about information being transmitted through a channel. Uh, oh. In this case, it's a channel that carries the information through time. Now, that's of course what recurrent nets try to do but they're doing it in a preposterously extravagant way by uh, recirculating the spike train, right? At uh, 10 to the 8th uh, ATPs per spike. What about Sinfire chains? Have you worked on Sinfire chains? 
I'm sorry, say it again. Sim fire change? Sim fire change for, as a way of transmitting me uh, memory? Look. Yeah, do, do you, I mean, people, so, uh, like uh, Michael Lassa, for example, they observed in, uh, in Thalamus, right? This uh, sequential activation for neurons, maybe in the data you, you have also. Yeah, but it has the same. That has the same energetic problem as all the others, and and also the volumetric problem. Look, at, you're using a whole chain of neurons just to preserve a single fact, right? Now, when you think about it, you say, wait a second, uh, a, uh, a a six base uh, polynucleotide could uh, preserve exactly the same information in uh, like uh, twelve orders of magnitude less volume, and that. Uh, uh, 15 orders of magnitude less energetic cost in producing it, and it's probably less noisy and more thermodynamically stable. I mean, why would one think of a synfire chain uh, when you've got uh, a uh, astronomically more efficient method readily to hand? Yep, I see your point. I don't know, <laughs> Simon, do you want to, to add anything to the discussion live, or if not, maybe we'll... Uh... Let me know. I spilled coffee on my laptop this morning when I logged in. <laughs> oh my God, I see. Okay, then, then I think we can uh, take a break because we have something like uh, more less than 50 minutes before the next session, take a break. Yeah, okay. Get some rest and reconvene at right. 5.15 uh, my time here in London, 12.15 uh, 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 Eastern time. <laughs> Fantastic, see you then. Okay. So we'll move to the next session in uh, something like right. less than 50 minutes. Right. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>